Hello everyone, this is Jane with Style of Substance. Today I'm ranking and discussing every Star Wars film from worst to best. No TV series, no behind the scenes documentaries, no Lego tie-ins. That's it. That's my intro. Let's go. Number 18, Star Wars Holiday Special. Come on, Marla, let's see a little smile. Come on. There, that's better. Try to enjoy your life day. Nowadays, people like to pretend that the George Lucas era of Star Wars was perfect, and Disney came and ruined it. And yeah, they kinda did, but honestly, when Lucas was steering the ship, you still had corporate cash grabs under the Star Wars IP, and the Star Wars Holiday Special is just the apotheosis of this. Lucas may be a unique artist with many interesting ideas, but he is still a billionaire businessman who benefits greatly from capitalism, more than any other filmmaker even, <laughs> except maybe like Spielberg. So in a way, I think the holiday special is really a byproduct of merchandising the Star Wars franchise to hell. Like, come on, it's a Star Wars holiday special. You can't get more consumerist than that. Now, Lucas had a vision in mind for the special, but the end product strayed away from this because Lucasfilm had to like drop out of their involvement and just let the TV companies uh, run wild because they had to work on um, Empire Strikes Back. But <laughs> they weren't really that successful um, in what they ended up doing because um, this film is a huge mess and the production was messy and the, the end product, it was just universally hated. And this led to Lucas uh, even disowning the entire thing. So what do I think of the film? Well, I think it's kind of just a bunch of annoying nonsense. I'll let my girlfriend Elaine take it from here. I was like awful. I was like getting my prostate examined. Yeah, I would kill myself too if I was in this movie. <laughs> I think you honestly summed it up best in the one statement in some fucking minstrel show. Of course, if your family has a heart, is that blackface? Just then, that old popular holiday favorite, the Panther Rump. I actually have no fucking clue. But only you know this. Is this the first transgender life. character in Star Wars? <laughs> Now it's, time to put it <laughs> it's literally just a fucking just pointless disgusting fucking fever dream that serves no purpose and says nothing oh it's like a little kid opening his presents this is so nice i think he should have jumped man it's just the most Fucking offensive, mind rotting, horrendous, disgusting dribble I've ever fucking seen in my life. Is Santa Claus giving him pornography? I guess he is. It's terrible in every conceivable fashion. Number 17 Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. Ray Skywalker. The saga is complete. Again. Until it's not. Again. Rise of Skywalker is easily the worst theatrically released Star Wars film to date because it represents everything wrong with Hollywood today. Somehow Palpatine returned. In a way, Palpatine's Frankenstein like return serves as a good thesis for the film. What once was thought of as finished has become resurrected, only to be killed off once again. That's how Disney's handling of this franchise went. How cynical it is to bring back this character while retconning everything the two original trilogies and even the two latest films worked for. And yet, it's fitting too. Rise of Skywalker is just a mess, and it's not really the good kind either. It's formally and ideologically all over the place, lacking both cohesion and purpose. There's very little value here. The production was doomed, and people were split down the middle by the last film, so the direction that this film took would be futile no matter what. 
Yet the corporate cash cow still tried to please everyone by squeezing every last drop of spoiled milk. With what I can only describe as like a marionette show with puppeteer digital corpses. Those who spot the lesbian kiss in the background deserve a medal more than Chewbacca does. I certainly missed it. I guess the real progressive kiss scene comes from Ben and Ray, who were technically cousins once removed, right? Even if you reject Palpatine being Anakin's creator, Rey still calls herself a Skywalker. She is still family with Ben. If there's one good thing I can say about this, is that there are these moments where the scenery is beautiful to look at. I think Abrams, for as messy as he may be as a filmmaker, he is still technically proficient in some ways. And there are some moments of like interest where the Force is used in new ways. I think that's something that I do like about these new films. Force itself basically is montage. That's kind of what Revenge of the Sith is like implying. So two shots in sequence connect to each other to form new meaning. Johnson understood this with those like uh, Force zoom calls in Last Jedi. And Abrams takes it to the next level by having characters fight each other in different locations. You know, at, at sometimes it is kind of cool, but uh, it's too bad that this confusing mess of a film is basically just written by Reddit, and it really shows. It, it's just terrible all the way through. Hey, kid. Number 16, Star Wars The Force Awakens. Chewie, we're home. It's like Disney is Pavlov and we are the dogs. They ring the bell and we salivate. Every moment of this is tailored to manipulate the audience and exploit their nostalgia by evoking a feeling, not of Star Wars, but of the idea of loving Star Wars. J.J. Abrams wants us to be reminded what Star Wars once was, and yet the film represents a pale imitation, a simulacrum, hardly resembling the original film beyond poorly replicated aesthetics and familiar story beats. Now, I remember when this film hit theaters, it was huge. My mathematics professor even told me it was my duty as an American to watch this film, just like it's my duty to vote. Uh, I think that's kind of a weird thing to say in hindsight. However, I think the film works only like in a culture that feels nostalgic for the old films and wants to see these characters back on screen. But once you're used to them being back, what impact does this film really have in the long run? Abrams promised the film would go back to the basics while keeping one foot forward, which is just a sign of formal regression. He also relies so much on his mystery box mentality, which is just another way of saying he lacks ideas, but hints at them anyway. Kept it locked away. Where'd you get that? A good question for another time. Abrams is kind of a shallow visual storyteller. He relies so heavily on contemporary committee approved quirk, and he's too insecure to let, just let the film breathe and slow down for more than 10 seconds. The momentum leaves you sick when you never slow down that merry-go-round. The actual story suffers considerably by relying heavily on character exposition, but hardly explaining the politics of the universe. The scene where the Republic is destroyed by the solar lasers should work better than it does and leave the audience with a sense of existential and political dread. However, we don't entirely know what is at stake here, who is and was in control, how seriously a threat people took the First Order, and who the Resistance is working for exactly. People complained about the politics in the prequel films, so Abrams dares not explain anything here. And as a result, we are left numb to moments that should be cataclysmic. You change your hair. Same jacket. No, new jacket. Number 15, Star Wars The Clone Wars. What's our plan of attack, sir? Follow me. 
To market the animated series Star Wars The Clone Wars, Lucasfilm and Warner Brothers released a movie stitched together by what would have been the first four episodes. The editing is really jarring as a result. An attentive viewer can notice the general time frame where one episode ends and another begins. The pacing is really wonky and there are attempts of tension and semblances of character arcs that really conclude as quickly as they are introduced. I saw the first two seasons of Clone Wars when it first aired, but I haven't been too compelled to continue. Maybe it gets better, but I just remember it being okay supplemental material, and that's about it. What the hell was that? Meanwhile, the 2003 Clone Wars series by Tartakovsky is more visually interesting. The characters in that move with such fluidity and grace, whereas everyone here is stiff and restrained to the point that it's weird that it's even animated. Lucasfilm should have put more money and time into this production, as it's pretty clear that the film is restrained by its relatively moderate budget. In addition to the rigid animation is a low level of attention given to the art design, especially as the film progresses. I guess there are some neat things at play. The opening narration is really propagandist. Nobody should leave the Republic, and if you do, that's bad. So let's join forces with crime lords in order to move troops beyond the current jurisdiction. It's also political, and the Jedi are these sort of cops just taking orders from the government that is exploiting them. The Huts control the Outer Rim, and we'll need their space lanes in order to move our troops. There is more to this kidnapping than it seems. I guess it's best to judge the movie as a lead-in to the series, but I don't know. It's such a rough lead-in. The entire film is inconsequential and superfluous. Uh, I do like Jabba's gay uncle, though. Mm, I like the sound of that. Take her to the dungeon! You will regret this, Zero. <laughs> no. I think I will become rich with this. <laughs> Number 14. Caravan of Courage, an Ewok adventure. Oh God, why did they do this to us? We only wanted to live, you and I. Why should they send us out to fight each other? Elaine and I interrupted our Star Wars binge to see All Quiet on the Western Front, which is a great film that I highly recommend. We watched that because we dreaded watching the TV movie The Ewok Adventure, later released theatrically as Caravan of Courage and Ewok Adventure. The adventurers gather for a traditional Ewok ceremony. Before they depart, Logre must bestow upon them the sacred totems of the legendary Ewok warriors. I remember seeing this film in its sequel at the library as a kid, and I always thought it was a ripoff or something. Between Return of the Jedi wasting so much time with the Ewoks and the fact that there are two of these movies, Tells me what everyone already knows. These teddy bears are money makers. At the very least, Lucas learned from the holiday special that a family of bear people roaring for an hour and a half doesn't make for the best viewing experience. And so this film has children to guide us. Furry. Kush? Furry. Furry. Mm. Yeah, furries. I wish we had furry creatures like you where I came from. Oh. We came on a star cruiser and we crashed. We crashed? Furries? Furries? This is a furry movie. This is a child. This is, a, this is literally a movie about a child discovering their fucking sexual fetish with furries. Oh no. Watching Caravan of Courage is sort of like pulling your brain out from your skull and tossing it towards a pack of wolves. One would think the wolves would tear it apart, but instead they just sniff at it and let it sit there. The film is fairly inoffensive and there's some fun for little kids to have, like very little kids, but I am left numb and indifferent. The story is not particularly compelling and the highlight moments that work well on their own visually are undercut 
by the narrator re-explaining what we just saw or are seeing. Deej sees a strange shining object in the trees below. What the fuck? But anxious to find why, his is missing this, children. Why do they have a narrator over everything? I was kind of caught off guard by the presence of real world animals also. I mean, I guess Empire has some lizards and snakes, Return of the Jedi has some rats, and Phantom Menace has some birds. But here the Ewoks have it all. Horses, llamas, goats, ferrets, chickens, owls, rabbits, and magic lizards that transform into mice. It's ultimately uninspired in this respect. A New Hope used elephants for the Banthers after all. I don't know what there is to say about this film other than Lucasfilm should have put more money into it. Um, it's charming at least, but it doesn't really do much. I feel like I like it more than uh, whatever the fuck the animated movie was, but I think I like Rogue One a little more. Clone Wars? I, yeah. Yeah, I like Clone Wars. Number 13, Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. Be careful not to choke on your aspirations, director. I know Rogue One is studio metal to death, but at least the narrative structure is fairly coherent. And the humor isn't just so overbearing. Um, which I can't really say for Rise of Skywalker or Force Awakens. Uh, I've been back and forth on whether this or Solo is the better spinoff, as I think this has higher highs, but it also has lower lows, and yet it is more consistent overall. I guess I should give it some props for formal deviation, but the moments of masturbation to original trilogy iconography, uh, save for the character cameos, are where the film succeeds the most visually. The third act offers the most in terms of scenes bordering on emotional catharsis and actually something dynamic to look at. The rest of it is pretty flat. And I think this may be a result of the fact that there are two directors making this. I feel like the beach scene is in the concurrent space battle is where the film is at its best as it displays a real sense of scale with those walkers especially. When there isn't any action happening on screen, the film tends to be fairly cookie cutter. And yeah, I don't really recommend it for people. You're letting her keep it. Would you like to know the probability of her using it against you? It's high. Let's get going. It's very high. I honestly don't have a whole lot to say about this film. Moff Tarkin's CGI constructed face is the apotheosis of Uncanny Valley. I think you can look at his face and use it as a metaphor for what went wrong with Star Wars under Disney. They're trying to reanimate something that's been dead for so long and insist that it's just like what you remember, but it's just a pale imitation, a corporate homunculus. What does this all amount to? Making sense of a plot hole that was never a plot hole? Do we really need a whole film to explain why, is it, why there's a hole in the Death Star? I feel bad for the aging croaks of James Earl Jones' voice. This film just shouldn't exist. Number 12, Solo A Star Wars Story. I don't have people. I'm alone. Um... Solo. I think I dislike the principles at play more than I dislike the actual film. For as superfluous as Solo may be, I found myself weirdly enjoying it a lot more upon revisiting. Of course, it follows the tradition of Disney's Drek by McDonaldizing Star Wars into the Marvel formula, with barely any individual identity of its own. The lack of creativity is apparent in the fact that all of the new aliens in these movies either look like naked mole rats or yaks. After firing the original directors, they brought in Ron Howard, who has boomer sensibilities, in an attempt to connect with the youth without accounting for generational dissonance. 
I can't for the life of me tell if the L337 droid is Howard's playful attempts at parroting contemporary activism or a sincere attempt at engaging with it and applying it to the droids. They're using you for entertainment! <laughs> yeah, you've been neuro -washed. Don't just blindly follow the program. Exercise some free will! <laughs> Theoretically, you could do something interesting here with the idea of droid exploitation and liberation, but they don't. Instead, it's just a robot with child-rearing hips that screams liberation at other machines. It's not very good. Uh, for the most part, Solo is just on a roller coaster ride. It's not particularly fast, um, but it's fast enough. There's not many loops, but there's enough loops. I find the film mostly innocuous and weirdly entertaining in the most superficial white noise way possible. But let's call a spade a spade. This is a cash grab, and it's good that it flopped. It teases at the next solo adventure with Darth Maul, but thank God they're not doing more anytime soon. That sounds so bad. Kira. You and I will be working much more closely from now on. Number 11. Zen, Grogu and Dust Bunnies. Seeing a collaboration between Studio Ghibli and Lucasfilm was unexpected, but this short film is cute, I guess. It's hand-drawn too, so that's a plus. It follows Grogu from The Mandalorian as he's trying to meditate, but keeps getting interrupted by the Susu Watari from Hayao Miyazaki's My Neighbor Totoro and Spirited Away. I guess those films are Star Wars films too now. I never much cared for the whole mania surrounding Baby Yoda. It just seems like an obvious marketing gimmick where cuteness sells, but it's neat seeing his likeness be adapted to this animation style. In fact, he doesn't even really look like Baby Yoda anymore, more like a Buddhist mouse. And it is cute. I like how he keeps trying to escape the dust bunnies, but they end up giving him a flower and he smiles. It ends with an incomplete Enzo circle to signify the beauty of imperfection. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say about this one considering it's only three minutes and speaks for itself. Number 10, Star Wars Biomes. The fact that Star Wars Biomes doesn't have any credits is a little bit alarming considering how uh, Disney doesn't exactly treat um, <laughs> their animators the best. But also because it doesn't have a credited director, who knows, maybe James Benning directed it. Um, so this is another short film that was released on Disney+. Plus. Um, it showcases, like, recognizable Star Wars landscapes from bird's eye point of view as the camera swoops through computer-generated environments and shows off this grand scale of nature that sometimes is still, but other times interrupted. The presence of battleships and menacing architecture amidst these ecosystems creates an alienating effect. I think even though this is all made in computers, it can make us reflect on our own world and how people are destroying nature that we rely so much on in order to survive. I think what I like about this film is that it is much more abstract in design than anything else produced under the Star Wars name, as it takes us beyond the characters and their stories and into a much larger universe. If there's something I don't like about this film, it's the fact that it relies heavily on locations from the original trilogy and Disney's films and series and not so much the prequels. 
where Lucas's imagination went the most wild. There's so much untapped potential, but we are left with only a fraction of what could have been. If they keep doing more Star Wars, which let's face it, they will, I hope they end up expanding this concept in particular. Number nine, Ewoks, the battle for Endor. Aha! Do not come around bothering me. I guess you can call me a battle for Endor defender. This movie rules. Okay, it's not like it's great or anything. In fact, it's pretty all over the place, but it's completely bonkers from start to finish. The directors, Jim and Ken Wheat, were apparently not very happy with the way the first one by John Corti turned out. And you can tell this by the way they try to make things right with this one. Yoda was wrong, do or do not, but there is indeed a try. They try like crazy here, even if the budget doesn't support it. The narration is gone this time around, and the film opens with a massacre at the Ewok village, and protagonist Sindel's whole family is even slaughtered. It's pretty amusing, honestly. Also, I just want to point out again, they don't blink. Yeah, what? Hurry. Eh, whatever, it's a fantasy. Not all animals have eyelids. But we know that they do because we've seen them sleeping, and they do then. They're not fish! <laughs> How do you know? Look at them! I don't know, they could be furry fish. <laughs> Furry fish. The film has next to nothing to do with Star Wars also outside of the Ewoks. It could have just been anything else in the fantasy genre with a light sci-fi bent. It's a strange movie that's made stranger due to the Ewoks talking. You know what? You're my best friend. Mm, yes, best friend. And even though not everything makes the most sense, I was thoroughly entertained from start to finish. So that counts for something. Well... It's an improvement over the first film because the first film is just like the bare minimum for what it takes to be like an Ewok children's adventure movie. And it has like narration over like the most minuscule details that don't need it to be there. Though to be fair, if you're a Star Wars fan watching this, you probably need it considering you have probably the attention span of like a fucking infant out of straight out of the womb. But thankfully, Ewoks too does not need to like breastfeed you so heavily while watching the movie because it, the movie is just so absolutely insane. Number eight, Star Wars: The Last Jedi. So my opinion on The Last Jedi has gone back and forth each time I've seen it, but I've maintained the perspective that it is significantly weaker than Lucas's six-part saga and significantly better than Abrams' output. Not that that's saying much. This time around, I think it's okay. It certainly could be better, but it's as good as a Star Wars film will ever get under Disney. There doesn't need to be some ridiculous and manufactured culture war surrounding this film. Just because a large percentage of the people who hate this film are complete losers and bigoted assholes doesn't make the film some subversive masterpiece. In fact, when we compare it to the prequels, uh, the subversion really falls flat. Every thematic direction the film takes, Lucas had already done it better. I need not to explain my issues, as they are shared with many others, just not to the same degree of intensity. The Sith. Jedi, the rebels, let it all die. Ray, I want you to join me. We can rule together and bring a new order to the galaxy. Don't do this, Ben. Please don't go this way. No, no, you're still holding on! Let go! 
Aside from the eye-rolling attempts at humor, the film doesn't rely so much on manipulating the audience and exploiting their nostalgia as the previous one does. It's easily better for that alone, because I find that really insulting. Now, if Johnson had written and directed the other two, this would probably be a more realized vision, instead of being brought down by following the continuity of Abrams. There surely would be a more cohesive through line and not constant reminders of compromise. Perhaps I admire Johnson for throwing a wrench into the trilogy doomed from its conception. Maybe it's good that he ruined it, so that people would stop blindly embracing mediocrity. For whatever it's worth, I don't really view Johnson as a hack like I do Abrams. He has his own vision and that's fine. It's just too bad that what he's doing is just building off of Abrams, which is just so bad. Disney can milk that beach monster all they want. It still won't taste good when it's green. Number seven, Star Wars Episode Six, Return of the Jedi. With each passing moment, you make yourself more my servant. No, it is unavoidable. It is your destiny. The sparring match between the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy must end. Both trilogies have their own strengths and weaknesses, and I think all six films are better than anything that came after. While I still think there's a lot of great things to be found in Return of the Jedi, it's ultimately the least realized of the six films, and Mark Land's direction is certainly a step down from Lucas and Kirshner respectively. So many shots are done more so as coverage of a subject or situation, and less as carefully planned uh, communication of an idea. We have powerful friends. You're gonna regret so this. So I, I just wanna ask you, baby, do you think that Jabba might be Kylo's father? Oh. The film's overall structure is strange, dragging out the first act for so long only to wrap it up with uncharacteristic quick cuts, only to then remain in a forest purgatory until we wade our way to the admittedly fun and action-packed climax. People rightfully praise the characterization of Luke, now a Jedi Knight, finally facing off against his father and bringing what good that is left in him out once again. And of course, everything with the Emperor is cool, even though he has next to no character development without seeing the prequels. Yes, all of this stuff is great, but what do we make of the characterization of Han and Leia? After the first act, they take the back seat. They hardly act like their old selves. It's like Han never recovered from the carbonate hibernation and just acts like this bumbling idiot with a grin on his face. Hey, it's me. And Leia just lost all of her personality. It's really awkward to see it unfold when you watch it back to back with the other two. Of course, acting is one of the most overrated aspects of film, so it's not like I couldn't find some enjoyment out of the cast seemingly coked out performances. Quite the contrary, it's actually a blast to watch. No, Luke run away, far away. If he can feel your presence, then leave this place. The much maligned Ewoks have their place thematically, as the series has always been about the little guy winning the day, and it's ultimately nature that overcomes technology. That's fine and all, but it's still a weird choice considering just how much time the audience spends with this teddy bear tribe, and how long it seems to get to the point of their existence in this film. Even with these distractions, it's hard not to recognize how unironically good the majority of the film is. The production design is absolutely stunning, and full of creativity all around. The iconography has been so cemented in culture that it's easy to forget how insane everything involving Jabba and his sex slaves and monsters are, or how beautifully designed the spaceships and set pieces are. The production design and special effects are where the film shines the most, but I can't help but wonder what it would look like under Lynch or even Cronenberg's direction. Admiral, we have enemy ships in sector 47. It's a trap! <laughs> so are we. As far as which cut I think is best, I would honestly go with the 1997 special edition version. 
Not only is the pacing improved by swapping the musical number with something more kinetic and memorable, but the celebration in the forest is replaced with a galaxy-wide celebration and topped off with a far superior score. I don't think the 2004-2011 editions did much to improve the material beyond adding in more planets. I sort of understand the desire to make the Ghost of Anakin be his appearance in Episode 3, but I still think it would have been better to keep it the way it was. I mean, I get it, but Anakin was always there after all. I'll not leave you here. I've got to save you. You already have. Look. You were right. You were right about me. Number six. Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones. Are you allowed to laugh? Thought that was forbidden for a Jedi. Attachment is forbidden. Possession is forbidden. Compassion, which I would define as unconditional love, is central to a Jedi's life. My attitude towards the prequels have shifted around over the years, but by now I think that they're all good and interesting movies. Um, and it seems that they're undergoing some cultural reevaluation too. Although I think some of the more prominent prequel apologists tend to be insufferable as they act like they're so smart for seeing Star Wars as high art. In some ways I've been guilty of this too, but I had an identity crisis at the time. In reality, these films are simply blockbusters. Sophisticated and culturally significant blockbusters, but blockbusters nevertheless. And that's perfectly fine for the most part. They aren't flawless and they aren't high art either. High art isn't even real. They're dead. Every single one of them. And not just the men, but the women and the children too. So back in August, I had the pleasure of seeing all three of these prequels back to back in the cinema with my girlfriend. We both agreed Attack of the Clones was the weakest of the three. It plays with genre more than the others, going from neo-noir mystery to science fiction, from romance to western, from gladiator to war, and then to samurai picture and digital Muppet show. Now, don't get me wrong, this is actually pretty cool, as messy as it is. Creativity reigns. This was the first Star Wars film to be shot digitally, and it pushes the potential for CGI. The artificiality makes sense too. In the time of war, people become more and more detached from reality. I mean, even the clone troopers are CGI. It is analogous to the Gulf War because it's largely simulated with artificial soldiers. Also that a few people that are in power can achieve even more power. The war is orchestrated and not with any real purpose beyond this. The Jedi are just fighting this war without realizing that the true enemy is sitting right in front of them. Throughout the original trilogy, Lucas was constructing all of this new iconography that became so ingrained in culture and what it represents that by the time we get to the third act of Attack of the Clones, all these symbols that were once framed as evil are now being framed as good, and the distinctions between good and evil become more muddled. The Jedi are working with stormtroopers and driving around Star Destroyers. Uh, what is the most interesting here to me is that Lucas is playing with his own iconography and subverting it. I have to admit that without the clones, it would not have been a victory. Victory? Victory, you say? Master Obi-Wan, not victory. The Shroud of the Dark Side has fallen. Begun. The Clone War has. Elaine, what do you have to confess? I've made a severe and continuous lapse in my judgment. I, Elaine Fuentes, hereby say that episodes 1 and 2 of Star Wars, directed by George Lucas, 1999 and 2002 respectively, are indeed good movies. Number 5. 
Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. At last we will reveal ourselves to the Jedi. At last we will have revenge. You have been well trained, my young apprentice. They will be no match for you. With the prequels, I see the first one as representing childhood, the second one adolescence, and the third adulthood. It's also the gradual descent from light to darkness. The scene with the younglings in episode three is much more effective when we can see a bit of young Anakin in that kid. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Unlike the other two, Phantom Menace still at least feels like the original trilogy, um, enough with respect to aesthetic, narrative, and pacing. Lucas's return as director is welcomed. If we look at the pod race scene alone, we can see how successful Lucas is at maintaining momentum and a sense of speed. Ben Burt also introduces all these new iconic Star Wars sounds that are basically limited to this scene, and this scene alone, and yet we remember them. They're that iconic. I think John Williams kept topping himself under Lucas with this iconic score. Duel of the Fates is as powerful as everyone says, and it accompanies some of the best fight choreography in the series. The visual effects and set design provide plenty of sensory splendor as we are introduced to all these new locations with new characters and creatures inhabiting them. Many take issue with Jar Jar Binks though, and uh, let's face it, I get it. I don't really mind him as much as some people, but I get it. In addition, I know that some people argue that the aliens are ethnically or racially coded stereotypes, and yeah, it can be a stretch at times, but Lucas is pulling from all of these different sources through his kaleidoscope of homage. And it just so happens that some of these sources may be a bit insensitive. I was not aware of such failure. The Temple of Doom does this a bit more explicitly to the point that it's almost a parody. This here seems a bit more incidental. It's also weird seeing like um, Jar Jar's little antics at the, in the battlefield being cross-cut with um, Darth Vader's duel. It's really tonally strange. But I don't know, I like this film overall. He is the chosen one. He will bring balance. Train him. Number four, The Hidden Fortress. あ、何を見たんだ。知れろ。何にも勝っ<笑><笑><笑> <laughs> Akira Kurosawa's The Hidden Fortress is probably the strongest narrative and formal influence on the original Star Wars, uh, with the exception of maybe Joseph Campbell's A Hero with a Thousand Faces. Seeing that my master's degree project is on Akira Kurosawa, I couldn't pass up a chance to highlight one of his films. The fact that this only makes number four on my list is a testament to how strong I find Star Wars when it's at its best, because Kurosawa is easily one of the greatest and most important filmmakers to have ever lived. This film in particular though, it is far from Kurosawa at the height of his powers, but even beyond its inspirational blueprints for Star Wars, it's a fascinating film in its own right. And I think this is a good gateway film to Kurosawa's work if you happen to be a fan of Star Wars. In a way, this is proto-Star Wars. Where Lucas used the droids as unlikely vessels into a larger story, Kurosawa uses peasants who get caught up in a peripheral battle between clans and search for gold. Eventually the narrative unfolds and the characters they meet along the way become main characters. This may be an interesting way to tell a story and flesh out the world, but Kurosawa also took interest in humanizing the lower class and treating them as equals. Uh, which is something that historically in Japan, peasants were seen more as like animals to the noblemen. <laughs> Kamatte, 
一組になるのが嬉しいのだとっても嬉しいやこんなお前すぎより隣にかしゅうや In addition to R2 and 3PO being seen in the peasants, we can see the inspiration for Princess Leia through the strong feminine force that is Princess Yuki, the empowering evil of Darth Vader, and General Tadakoro, and the graceful warrior that is Obi Wan through Roku Roda. Fun fact Lucas originally envisioned Toshio Mifuni to play Obi Wan. <laughs> But as for as good as I think The Hidden Fortress may be, I prefer many of Kurosawa's other films, but this one does capture some of his signature style,、um, like his expertise in shot composition, patience in action direction, and attention to the natural world, all as tools to convey mood and atmosphere. There's a beauty behind it all. You should really watch this film instead of constantly wasting your time with all the Star Wars stuff. Number three, Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. The Force is what gives the Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us, it penetrates us, it binds the galaxy together. To get this out of the way, many of the special edition changes in the original Star Wars enhance immersion, such as the improved special effects during the film's climax. However, some of the scenes in Mos Eisley, while understandable conceptually speaking, are a bit too jarring because it's often, but not always, obvious what is 1977 and what is 1997 and after. In my opinion, the superfluous Job of the Hut scene should have stayed on the cutting room floor for multiple reasons. Job, you're a wonderful human being. We can enjoy the original Star Wars, or should I say, A New Hope? I shouldn't dead name, and neither should you. In the context of these two paralleling trilogies, or we can make an attempt to imagine we were in the audience back in 1977 on opening night. The experience would be unforgettable. It's easy to take for granted how rich the iconography is when we are just so accustomed to it. And for better or for worse, Lucas successfully reconstructed culture. The cultural legacy is a bit misleading, as Disney's attempt to replicate the feeling of Star Wars is a simulacrum, distant from what A New Hope even was. This was the Death Star, and this is Star Killer Base. So it's big. The film is relatively slow and it is more emotionally driven, pulling from influences of Akira Kurosawa, John Ford, and Sergio Leone. There's an emphasis on scope, as we cut back and forth between two different points in the galaxy, as we go from seeing a desert farm to a battle station. Oh A New Hope succeeds in its simplicity by both embracing and subverting the familiar narrative beats of the hero's journey story, while channeling Lucas's experimental sensibilities that began with his student films. I think what the film is truly about, however, is faith. Kenobi isn't the only hope because there is always hope to be found. The ability to destroy a planet is insignificant next to the power of the Force. Don't try to frighten us with your sorcerer's ways, Lord Vader. Your sad devotion to that ancient religion has not helped you conjure up the stolen data tapes, or given you clairvoyance enough to find the rebels' hidden fort. Vader knew that the Empire was too confident in their abilities. 
that they underestimate not only the little guy, but the force itself. It is not a plot hole whatsoever that the Death Star has such an easily exploitable weakness, and we never needed any weird spin-off film to explain it, because it's all contextual, purposeful, and necessary. There's a hope to be found. Hey, Luke. May the force be with you. Number two, Star Wars Episode Five, The Empire Strikes Back. Apology accepted, Captain Nida. I think there are two tonal trajectories that Star Wars could have taken following A New Hope. Build upon the universe and ground it into something more intimate and intense, or embrace the camp. Between The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, it seems that Lucas was having his cake and eating it too. Hey, it's me. Personally, I think Kirshner's approach to the material is the more impressive of the two, and allows us to take the characters and situations more seriously, through more attention to dialogue, relatively subtle acting direction, more dynamic camera work, intense atmosphere, and the best score and special effects in the original trilogy. When I'm watching Revenge of the Sith, I champion CGI, and when I'm watching Empire Strikes Back, I champion practical effects. I think the film is structurally sound too, and it all leads up to an emotional gut punch of a twist ending. The film has been so cemented into pop culture that it is easy to take that ending in particular for granted, but I luckily was able to watch it with somebody who was in the dark about who Darth Vader really was. You see, I used to date this international student from Pakistan, and I guess uh, Star Wars isn't as popular there. So she was really surprised by the revelation when we watched it together. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough! He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. I was delighted to see her jaw drop and her face light up with excitement. The film is great all the way through, though. Well, I guess I question the underlying implications of the Han and Leia romantic subplot. Han may be right about Leia's repressed feelings, but the coercive manner he brings them out is romanticized, and it's not exactly the most appropriate. Um, it might not be the best message to send to children. Scoundrel. Scoundrel. I like the sound of that. Stop that. Stop what? Stop that. Other than that, the film is great and just about all the special edition changes are welcome and immerse us even more into this world. I just wish that the Emperor looked more like how he does in Return of the Jedi than Revenge of the Sith, but that's just nitpicking at this point. I love this film. You alright? Yeah. Be careful. You too. Number one, Star Wars Episode Three, Revenge of the Sith. Anakin is the father, isn't he? I'm so sorry. The best way to watch the Star Wars saga, in my opinion, is to go four, five, six, and then one, two, three. You can skip the rest. What? What did you say? I feel like the binary sunset works a lot better when we end on that. Instead of seeing it um, in the binge only 30 or 40 minutes prior. It's a powerful and emotional moment best seen as a starting point and an ending point of the main story. Return of the Jedi ends with the celebration of society returning to the way it was, and therefore the cycle begins again. I don't think there is much of a story left to tell. The end of Rise of Skywalker is redundant. 
While an argument can be made for A New Hope and Empire, I really do feel like Revenge of the Sith is the best Star Wars has ever been, and ever will be. What? And it's easily the best edited of the series, that's for sure. I really appreciate the juxtaposition of life, death, light, and dark. Throughout the film, and especially in the final moments with the childbirth coinciding with Darth Vader's concurrent transformation. The film really plays up the operatic elements that the other prequels dip their toes into, and contextualizes the entire film around them. You were my brother, Anakin! I loved you! The Force itself is communicated through this cross-cutting montage of contrasting images. One character in a completely different location will directly feel and respond to the other in real time, just as the film cross-cuts between them. This thematic and geographic unity of diegetic montage is made explicit in the subtle sadness present in a notable scene, the quiet and meditative moment of conflict and desperation. Anakin stares outside of a window at the city skyline and contacts Padme and is brought to tears. We see the distance between the two, both physically and emotionally. I shouldn't need to explain how great of a scene this was and how it serves as a formal and thematic thesis from the entire saga. Characters literally respond to the sequence of geographically separate images as they unfold, contextualizing the force as montage itself. Hello there. General Kenobi! <laughs> you are a bold one. <laughs> Kill him. Where the other prequels fell short, this film succeeds. It finds a confident balance between lighthearted fun and melodramatic tragedy, reflecting Anakin's fall from grace and subsequent indoctrination into the dark. This is some really great filmmaking, and it's full of creativity, thematic prowess, and theatrical mastery. This film will stand the test of time. There's good in him. I know. I know there's... Still... Baby. Honey. Tell me, what do you think of Revenge of the Sith in comparison? It's, uh, I remember as a kid watching Revenge of the Sith thinking, this is definitely better than the other two. And I rewatch it now, I still think that exact same thing. Uh, uh. <laughs> Thank you everybody for making your way to the end of this video. Uh, it was really fun making this and watching all the films with my girlfriend. Well, actually it was kind of torturous, but uh, we had fun together. Um, make sure to check out um, Elaine's ranking and discussion video. That's on her channel. That one's unscripted, uh, but I put that together, um, collecting like some of her thoughts. Uh, it's pretty fun. Uh, I hope you enjoy what I had to offer here. Um, please uh, like, subscribe, share my work around, and comment below. Let's get a conversation going. Um, I decided to put this out because a lot of people wanted me to do another uh, prequel apologetics video, and I kept telling them, oh, I'll do that uh, in 2022. But uh, yeah, that's not happening, and it's not happening anytime soon. I just am not that interested because uh, to be honest, I just want to have fun with Star Wars. And at this point, I, I don't even want to make a follow-up. I'd rather just redo that thing because I, I just uh, I just see so many flaws with it. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I don't think I'm going to touch Star Wars again anytime soon because uh, it's, uh, I don't know, it's for nerds. The Star Wars Holiday Special, sponsored by General Motors. People building transportation to serve. Oh, so this is how it is, huh? 
Oh, poor Chewie. He's not gonna get home in time for Christmas. <laughs> no, it's not Christmas, it's Life Day. What's Life Day? Yeah, it's not Christmas. Well, I guess it's not. I guess I don't think Jesus Christ and Christianity is in Star Wars. Yeah. But but there is but there is hell. Yet. There is hell because Han Solo does say, "I'll see you in hell." Then I'll see you in hell. I mean, we did see the devil in Episode Four. Yeah, the devil just some random guy that goes to the bar. <laughs> I feel like Alex is in the right now. I have no idea what they're thinking. Yeah, I know. There's no subs. <laughs> I kind of like that about it, though. <laughs> it may just be like the TV saturation, but it looks like it's blackface. What? She has four arms, too? Yeah, it's Star Wars. It's <laughs> Star Wars. Teachers have four arms. They're an alien, I guess. Who is this guy? The Santa Claus? He's the guy, no, he's the guy from the other extreme. No, it's Santa Claus. <laughs> no, he's even has presents, it's Santa Claus. <laughs> it's the Life Day Santa Claus. So this is what this old pervert Chewy is into. Just a regular woman. He looks like he has autism. What? Which has been sought by our forces and by the Oh my god. The animation. Oh my god, the animation is so weird. I'm, every time they make noise, it sounds like I'm hearing an animal be slaughtered in the other room. But I'm just forced to be sat down and watch the uh, children's film that my parents have put on for me to distract me from the noise of the animal's life being sucked out by with a cruel blade of a knife. But I can't help but hear it enter my ears in a perpetuous way into my brain. So now it's just ingrained into what I'm watching. Watching. Thank you for selecting our brand of mini transmitter. If you assemble it properly, following the instructions I am about to give you, it will provide you, many years you know, of every time I hear their issues. moan. It sounds like I'm hearing a baby cow get its throat slit. <laughs> and then Let's being hacked started, apart to ma be made the veal. Fine. Is she pouring like water into the guy's head? Mm -hmm. Was he a kappa? What on earth? I... But he's a chia pet. <laughs> he's a chia. Ch 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 chia. They're going to heaven now? They're going to heaven? This monkey's gone to heaven. Yeah, they go to fucking. They go to like a, uh, what was it called? Uh, Eyes Wide Shut Party in the Stars. <laughs> I hope that this day will always be a day of joy in which we can reconfirm our dedication and our courage, and more than anything else. Our love for one another. This is the what? promise of the tree of life. <laughs> what? <laughs> what tree of life? <laughs> what, what tree? You know, the one in the stars. The tree in the stars? I guess, I don't know. Well, keys are tall or something. <laughs> what? <laughs> because the trees are tall. Well, keys aren't trees. Yeah, but they're tall like trees. <laughs> they're tired. Oh my god, that was so bad. Ugh, fucking terrible. Oh my god, that's... Oh my god. I'm gonna shoot myself in the fucking foot. Jeez. Hey. 
me.